Welcome to Vineyard Boise. It's our vision to make the invisible God visible wherever He places us. We come together on Sundays to worship and fellowship corporately. But we know that church isn't just about Sunday. It's about a lifelong day-to-day following of Christ with other believers. We invite you to join us just as you are. If you'd like to support our ministry, visit vineyardboise.org and click the Give Online button. Well, as those baskets are going around, i put a picture real quick. This is a picture of Andrea and I uh, last week when we were down in San Diego for some leadership meetings. This couple here is uh, Marvin and Carmen Suarez. They are the pastors of the church that we've been working with down in Puerto Rico. And um, I, I had not had a chance to meet them and realize who it was we were working with, but they were there. And so we got a chance to connect. And they just asked uh, us to express their appreciation for how, how much they've appreciated partnering with us to see all the relief work going on in Puerto Rico. Uh, as it said in the video, they're, they're worn out and they're needing a new season. So this last team that's going will be the last team for now. Uh, we may eventually reboot that, but, but we're going to shift gears and we're probably going to be doing some relief work in the aspect of helping them establish a food pantry. Uh, they, are, they do not have a food pantry on their side of the, of, of the island. And so that's a way forward that, that we can um, come alongside them with. So, um, and then before we get into our message, I just got to remind you, Easter is coming. And actually for us, uh, this whole resurrection season begins really with Palm Sunday next week. And so uh, next week is Palm Sunday. The week in between Palm Sunday and Easter, we have uh, the Stations of the, of the Cross, and we have a, a Friday night service. And so um, there's a lot going on. Uh, but you're going to want to be here because it's really next week is part one. And then on, on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, we'll have three services. They won't be at their normal time. So they'll be 8, 10, and 12. All 8 a.m., 8 a.m., 10 a.m., and 12 p.m. So... We're doing that to accommodate more people. We recognize the 10 o'clock service is, is going to be probably the most popular, the most desirable. And so we would ask you to consider if you have the option, if you would consider either going early or late, either going 8 o'clock or 12 o'clock, to make sure that we have, especially that we've got room for guests. Um, and, and so if you'd consider that, that would help. We have these little brochures as you leave today. They're little invite cards that have all the details. And our ushers will hand those out as you leave today. You can take as many as you want. Um, because they're not just to save the date for you, they're also invites for other people. And would encourage you to invite somebody who, who maybe wouldn't come to church normally, but maybe during Easter season they're more open. And so maybe this is an opportunity. So um, we're excited about what God's been stirring in, our, in the hearts of our team as we've been planning Easter. we got some, some great stuff. Um, but, <laughs> oh, before I move on from that, one thing we need... We need help in children's ministry because we're doing three services. So we're staffing three services for children. Uh, so if you could also, in addition to coming to one service, if you could serve in one service, that would be really helpful. We really want guests to come to have a good guest experience. We, we want them to feel like their kids are well cared for, that there's enough people watching over their kids so that they can be in here and be present and not like giving it mental energy to, I wonder if my kids are okay. So if that's something you can help with, you can go to vineyardboise.org slash go. Just our website with the slash go, and there's a, a button for signing up for helping with children's ministry, and um, we can connect with you that way. Okay, so as for this morning, we're wrapping up our study of Judges, and this actually sets the stage for uh, where we're going in Easter, but this is the end of the book of Judges, and we've, we've said from the very beginning that we were moving towards total eclipse. Okay, even on our backdrop back here that, that Jesse and Dottie have been working on, Jesse and Dottie are part of our Vine Arts team. Um, they've been working on this, and if, if you've been here, it's been a work in progress. That it started with a picture that was bright and shiny and sunny. It looked like a brand new day. And that's the way the book of Judges actually starts. It starts with Joshua, uh, the end of Joshua, where the people of Israel have entered into the promised land. But it pretty quickly starts going dark. And it's, we've said all along it's moving towards total eclipse. So we see that it's in total eclipse now. And so that's where we're, we're looking at today is, um, is Israel in total eclipse. And we're going to go ahead and wrap up the last five chapters all in one day. And here's why. <laughs> it's not just so we can get to Easter. It's because the last five chapters are so dark. If we stretch them out over five weeks, we wouldn't have a church. <laughs> Um, and I can, so here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to take you through five chapters, which, which actually in my Bible, which is a, you know, it's a big Bible. It takes six pages of my Bible to, to cover those five pages. So I'm not going to read all of the text. I'm going to read some excerpts. And in between there, I'm just going to summarize. 
Um, but I can almost promise you that you have not heard a sermon preached from these passages. Okay? Because they're, they're really dark. They're bleak. Um, but, but we believe, here's one of our convictions as a church, is that all of Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable. It's inspired. It's inspired by God and it's profitable. If we take the time and the thoughtfulness to look at it and ask, God, how would you speak to us? And I actually believe that this, the message that comes out of this text is actually uh, an extremely important message for the day in which we live. So um, uh, I get to present it and just to make sure, just kind of stack the deck a little bit, I, I wore my leprechaun socks. So <laughs> you can feel good about that. You're in, you're in good hands. <laughs> um, I'll qualify this by saying these five chapters, if these five chapters, especially the last two, were they turned into a screenplay uh, and, and, and turned into a movie, even without adding anything, just being faithful to the text, this would not be a PG or a PG-13 movie. Uh, it would be a, a, at least rated R, maybe worse. Um, and, and so partly one of the reasons I'm summarizing today is for the sake of brevity and, and clarity, but also just because I know there's also innocent ears in the room. And so I will be um, judicious about how I communicate these things. But understand, this is, a, this is a hard word that the author ends this book with. So we're going to jump in in verse, um, chapter 17, verse 1. Uh, chapter 17 begins with an Ephraimite widow who's been robbed. Now, you're going to hear about different tribes. Remember, there's 12 tribes of Israel. Throughout the book of Judges, each one of the stories has been set usually within one specific tribe, maybe two tribes. Uh, today, you're going to actually hear from all 12 tribes. All 12 tribes will be involved in today's story. So it starts with the tribe of Ephraim, and there's this widow who's been robbed, um, and it's 1,100 pieces of silver. And that's, a, it's, that's a very significant amount in biblical days. It'd actually be a significant amount now. <laughs> um, but, but here's what, what scholars would tell us, Bible scholars would say it's most likely her dowry, which means that when she got married, uh, this was provided by her, her husband-to-be uh, as a dowry that if something should happen to him, either he would die before she did and she'd be widowed, which you know, was pretty more common than not, or if he would abandon her and, or divorce her, that she would have this, this, this kind of nest to take care of her, this kind of a nest egg. And um, that's the way things hopefully worked because uh, oftentimes in their culture, women didn't have the same kind of economic opportunities that we might have today. And so that was really their, their only hope. So she gets robbed. And, uh, and in response to that, in her despair, she declares a divine curse on the thief. Okay, you can picture it or hear it maybe sounding something like, you know, you know, may God deal ever so harshly with the person who stole, you know, our future, who stole our security. And she actually mentions this um, to her son. She has a, a son uh, and a grandson. She, she whispers to her son, she says that she whispered in his ear the curse um, on the person who had robbed them. So her son, Micah, that's his name, we find out later, his name's Micah, he decides he'd rather give the money back than be under a divine curse. <laughs> Did you see that coming? She's like, son, we've been robbed. We have no financial security. Uh, may God deal ever so harshly with the person who did that. And he's like, well, all right, here it is. <laughs> and then the mom, you know, this, is, this is a very special mother-son relationship. It's kind of along the, Bates, the, the, the lines of Norman um, Bates and his mother. It's, <laughs> Anthony Perkins and Psycho. Like, this is a special mother. You know, mother, what have you done? Um, he gives the money back, and she's so relieved. That she's relieved, and she reverses the curse with a blessing for such an honest boy. Okay? Now, now, mothers have a special capacity to do this, to, like, filter, right, what they're seeing. And so she, she doesn't see the fact that he robbed her. He sees that she, that he, she sees that he was honest. And so she's like, you know what? This kind of honesty, you're cut out for the priesthood. You really, you should be in ministry. And so, and so she takes one-fifth of her dowry. She takes one-fifth of it, and she goes to the local silversmith, and she commissions him to form an idol, like a household god, a graven image for her, because her son needs to be in ministry, and so he has to have some sort of uh, god in order to be in ministry, Right? So they go on to set up their own house temple. It's a shrine complete with idols, with priestly garments. And then Micah, he actually ordains his son, this is her grandson, to be a priest as well. So this is a 
great, healthy family, okay? What's the problem with that? There's, there's a no, well, there's a number of problems. I want to give you three major ones, and these are ones that any Israelite, anybody living in this time in, in Israel's history would have known because these were things that were um, big, large letters, you know, in, in their law. This is not like the fine print or, or the subtext. First of all, God had told them that making sacred images was forbidden. This goes back to Exodus 20, to the Ten Commandments, that making something with your hands and then saying, this is the God who made me, doesn't make sense, just on a logical level, and it's also really spiritually bad. And so they, they know this, no graven images, they know that God had instructed them that all of the priests were to be from the tribe of Levi. So out of the 12 tribes, you didn't have a, a priestly contingent within each tribe, the tribe of Levi were the only priests. And this guy's from Ephraim, and he's become a priest and he's ordained his son. And then thirdly, God had instructed that he would choose a centralized place in the promised land for them to worship. Now, in Deuteronomy 12, he'd said, look, when you get there, the, the locals living there, they worship on every hill under every tree. And, and, it's, and, and what they've done with their spirituality is very dark. And so I don't want you to do that. I want you to centralize in one place where we can keep it pure. So, well, it's just on those three levels. So our author who's writing this, he evaluates the situation, and here's what he says. Verse seven, 17, verse 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. When he considers this mother, considers her son, this is what he says. Well, this is a time when there was no king, and so everybody was just doing what was right in their own eyes. That's, that's a phrase that's going to get repeated four times in the last five chapters. Four times he's going to say, there was no king. Everyone was just doing what was right in his own eyes. This is, you know, we've talked about Israel's on this cycle, and it's a, it's, it's a cycle of sin. So they, they sin, and then they get sold into slavery, and then they cry out for a relief, and then God sends, raises up a deliverer, and then they have some time of rest, and then they go back to sinning. But that cycle, it's not just a cycle like this. It's a downward spiral. And Israel's circling the drain, as it were. So when he says this four times in these last five chapters, he's trying to make a point. He's trying to show this is, there's a decline going on here. And so there's, there's two things that he, he hints at here. He hints that this is the problem. Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. But he hints at what he thinks the solution is, right? So this brings us to the second vignette. And, and this author, these stories all are seemingly kind of disconnected, but he weaves them all together. There's a common thread that, that connects each story to the next. So from here, he focuses not on the widow who was robbed, but now on her son Micah. He's the, the uh, star of the next vignette. So the next one, a traveling Levite comes passing through Ephraim, and Micah bribes him to stay with them and become their priest. And this gives you a little glimpse into his worldview. He says... Um, having bribed this Levite to come and be a, an official priest for him, he says, now I know the Lord will prosper me because I have a Levite as a priest. See, he's treating this, this Levitical priest system like it's some sort of spiritual rabbit's foot. It's a lucky rabbit's foot, right? And so the author doesn't say how the son, the grandson, feels about being replaced, but this brings us to the third vignette, which um, involves the priest, and it starts with the author connecting that same theme again. He says, okay, in those days, there was no king in Israel. In those days, the tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for an inheritance to dwell in. For until then, no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. If you look at a map of the promised land, you'll typically, you'll, if you see it during the time of the conquest, it'll be divided into you know, tribal allotments. And at this point, Dan didn't have a, a, their own allotment, so they send five spies throughout the land looking for a place that's not yet settled by Israelites, but is settled by Canaanites, a place where they can conquer and then put down roots. So along the way, the five Danites, these five spies, they, they come through Ephraim and they meet Micah's priest, and he promises them success for their journey. When they, when they meet him, they're a little surprised because there's not typically priests in towns like this, and there's one in Ephraim, and they say, what's a Levite priest doing in Ephraim? And he says, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got this household shrine. And they say, okay, well, um, can you pray for us about our, our trip, our, 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 this conquest we're on? And so he prays for them, and he gives them a really affirming word. And so they like him because he said nice things. He tickled their ears. And so 
uh, they find a place, they, uh, they find a place called Laish that seems ripe for conquest. And then the five return home and gather 600 of their armed brothers to go out on this campaign to conquer Laish. The 600 of them travel through Ephraim en route to, en route to Laish, and they decide to steal Micah's priest and his household gods and the ephod. This ephod's the priestly clothes. And so the priest protests. He says, you can't just steal me. And they say, well, you gave us a good word, now you're our good luck charm. And he says, you can't do that. And they say, shut up. <laughs> Seriously, here's, it, 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 the language in ESV is, put your hand over your mouth. <laughs> shut up, right? And, 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 then they, and then they do the very first would you rather. <laughs> so with his hand over his mouth, they say, would you rather be a priest for one household or for an entire tribe. And when he, put, when he put it like that, he thinks, you know what, this is a promotion. And so then he goes with them willingly. Actually, it says that his heart was glad. And so he goes with them. But meanwhile, Micah gets home and finds that his priest is gone, his idols are gone, the ephod's gone, everything's gone. And he's not so happy. So Micah gathers his neighbors to chase the Danites and to confront their thievery. So he gets like six of his neighbors. And he overtakes them and he protests, hey, you stole the gods that I made and you stole my priest, which is just, it's just kind of funny. You stole my gods? Like, if someone can sneak into your house and take your god from you, that's not a very powerful god, I just want to say. But when confronted, the Danites ask Micah, what's the matter with you? This is quotes. What's the matter with you that you come at us with such a company? In other words, Dude, really? 600 of us armed on our way to war and the seven of you? Really? And he kind of surveys the situation and kind of takes stock of the numbers and he says, okay. And so he turns around and goes home um, pretty much just kind of sheepishly with his tail between his legs and he leaves without his priest. So meanwhile, the Danites proceed to conquer and inhabit Laish and then they establish a shrine there for Micah and his gods to be um, a worshipful place at. So all of that brings us to now our fourth vignette. And the connecting theme this time is there's a traveling Levite, just like there was a Levite that traveled up through Ephraim. This is still a traveling Le Levite. And um, this is where it gets weird. If you didn't think it was weird yet, <laughs> this is where it gets both weird and dark. In those days, again... When there was no king in Israel, a certain Levite was sojourning in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim, who took to himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. Okay, he took a concubine. That means he's already married, but he's taken an additional partner. And this could happen for a couple of reasons. This is pretty common in their culture. Um, but it could happen, one, because perhaps his first wife did not have children or, 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 or sons. Um, if his, his wife hadn't been able to give him an heir, then he might take on an additional concubine. And the concubine would have less rights and less uh, honor as a wife, um, but would be there to either provide children or sometimes were just taken for sexual gratification. Okay, you see this in like later on in scriptures, you see Solomon take a bunch of concubines. Well, he doesn't need that many. It's for, it's for sexual gratification. So the concubine though, the author tells us that the concubine was unfaithful. It's in quotes. Um, and leaves him to return to her father in Judah. The word unfaithful is not qualified. The author doesn't explain if that was moral unfaithfulness or just the unfaithfulness of her leaving him to go back home uh, south to Judah. But what it sets us up for is that the, uh, the Levite has to go and retrieve his concubine and is on a road trip. And the whole point of this is the road trip. Okay, so after four months, he waits. Is he in love with her? He waits four months to go get her. But the text says that he went to speak kindly to her. Okay? He goes to win her back and he also negotiates with her father. Five days of eating and drinking with her father leads to the return journey beginning in late afternoon. As you read the text, it, there's this long elaboration of the discussion between the Levite and his father-in-law. And, um, and, and the whole point of it is that he ends up staying longer than he intended. And when he at last leaves, it's almost evening, and that means he can't make the return journey home in one day. It means he's going to have to overnight somewhere, okay? Even as evening approaches, 
He's left, so he's got his concubine with him. He's spoken kindly with her, and she's re- agreed to come home. So he's got her. He's got his servant. Uh, they're traveling up north, and the servant suggests that they overnight in the town of Jebus. Uh, Jebus is the city that will uh, later become known as Jerusalem. At this point, it's not known as Jerusalem because it's not inhabited by Israelites. It's inhabited by the Jebusites, so it's Jebus. And um, the servant says, you know what? It's, you know, it's almost dark. Maybe we should just pull aside here to Jebus. They've got a Motel 6, you know, we'll stay there. And the priest says no. And he doesn't explain his reasoning except for to say, we will not stay with foreigners. We will stay with our own kinfolk. We'll stay with our own people. We'll, it may not be our tribe, but we will stay with Israelites, with Hebrew people. Uh, so they press on to the town of Gibeah, which is a, it's a town within the, the tribal allotment of Benjamin. And they wait in the city square for someone to take them in, but no one does. So they go into the town square, most highly visible, highly trafficked space, and they let it be known that they are there needing hospitality. They need a place to stay. They probably held up cardboard signs. And here's what their cardboard signs would have said. It would have said, we have our own provisions. In fact, we have enough to share. We just need a place to stay. And no one took them in until a non-Benjaminite comes along, an old man from Ephraim who's sojourning in Gibeah. That means he's from Ephraim, he's currently staying in Gibeah, but it's just a temporary thing. He's perhaps a migrant farmer. Um, He sees them and he insists they come home with him and not stay in the city square. He approaches them and he says, what are you doing? And they say, well, we're traveling through and we had no place to stay for the night. And so he says, you can't stay here. He doesn't tell them why they can't stay there. It's just clear that he doesn't think it's safe. He says, you, you have to come home with me. So they go home with him. And while they're relaxing over dinner, a mob of, in the text says, worthless fellows from Gibeah surrounded the house and demanded the old man surrender his guest that they may know him. And if you're familiar with the Hebrew scriptures, old, to, to know someone is used in a euphemistic way. It's, it's, a, it's a softer way to say something that if said directly would be very harsh. And so basically you've got this mob of men who surround the house and say, send out that guy that came to stay with you tonight because we want to have a forced sexual encounter with him. The old man begs them to not act so wickedly and then offers an alternative. They can have his virgin daughter and the Levite's concubine instead. Here's what he says. He says, don't do this wicked thing, my brothers. He said, but here's my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Uh, Do with them what seems good to you. Now, Again, remember, this is in a time when every man was doing what was right in his own eyes. And to entrust them to say, do whatever seems right to you, uh, this is not going to go well. Uh, In a time of moral anarchy, this won't go well. Up until now, this guy seemed like the good guy, right? He's the one that says, you can't stay here. You better come home with me. But you see how far Israel has fallen that his solution is to offer up his virgin daughter and the man's concubine. You see that he's most interested in two things. One, and they're both self-interest. One is his honor. This is a a time and culture where hospitality was one of the highest values. And and in a way that we can't even comprehend how being hospitable was was a a matter of honor and, and, and integrity in their culture. So much so that he would say, you can't do this to someone who's taken shelter in my house. Instead, here's a better alternative. So this is about his honor. It's about his own image. And it's also about his own life because he recognizes these these guys, if I don't appease them somehow, it's not going to go well with me. And so instead he offers his daughter. The mob refuses his offer, but then withdraws when the Levite shoves his concubine out, out to them and closes the door behind her. The text says that, that basically, as a gang, they ravage her all night and don't let her go until the sun comes up. As the sun's coming up, they finally let her go. The Levite prepares to leave in the morning and seems surprised to find his concubine lying on the doorstep. He would probably figured, you know what, she's gone for good this time. Uh, there's no nice words that I can say that will make up for what I just did. And so he doesn't expect to see her there, but he opens the door and she's lying there. And so his response is this. He, he kind of nudges her with his foot and says, get up, it's time to go. 
and she doesn't move. And so he puts her on his donkey, puts her body on his donkey, resumes the journey home. When he gets home, he, he cuts her into 12 pieces. He takes her body, cuts it into 12 pieces, and sends a piece to each of the tribes of Israel, which is an act of outrage that's both calloused and self-righteous. It's callous because this would be an offensive thing to do in any time in human history. But if you just pay attention as you read through the Hebrew scriptures, to not bury someone, to not give them a proper burial was an amazing indignity. Um, that was the way they actually showed dishonor to someone because of maybe they lived poorly, they wouldn't allow them to be buried. And so to cut her up in their culture was incredibly undignified. But then it's so self-righteous because... He, he put this in motion. He's the one that pushed her out the door to them. And he acts as if, as if it's the offense is all on them. So what does he do? He sends it out. So up until now, we've seen from four tribes. We've heard from Ephraim, from Levi, from Dan, and from Judah. But now all 12 tribes are invited. So from here on out, this is the entire nation of Israel. All who saw it, verse 30 of chapter 19, all who saw it said, such a thing has never happened or been seen from the day that the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt until this day, consider it and take counsel. When they say that such, when in, in outrage, people hear, when they, when they hear why he's done this, at first they get the peace, and they don't know what to make of it, and then he explains, here's what happened. And they say, such a thing has never happened in Israel. Well, the truth is, it's never happened by the people of Israel, but something like this has happened in the same land before. And if you go to, to Genesis 19, there's a story of, uh, of some angelic visitors coming down to this, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and having an encounter with Lot, who was a uh, nephew of Abraham. And, and it's a remarkably parallel encounter. Not, actually not quite as dark as this, but it's a very similar thing. And the whole point, the reason the author is telling the story, the reason he's telling the story and the way he puts it where he is is because he wants, to realize, he wants people to realize, his readers to realize, that Israel, with all of the hope that happened as they were coming into the promised land, has devolved to Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and, and God had offered Sodom and Gomorrah as kind of the ultimate expression of the reasons why he was sending Israel in to judge the locals. Remember when we, when we read Joshua, we, we, we saw that the, the Israelites coming into the promised land, was a, it was a gift to them, but it was also judgment on the inhabitants for their violence and wickedness. And Sodom and Gomorrah had been an example of that. So here's Israel now in the promised land, having sent the people out, and they've devolved. Bible scholars think that that story is actually told out of sequence, that it's put there at the very end to basically show total depravity. This sets up our fifth and final vignette, which focuses on the response of the other tribes. The outraged 11 tribes gather for war against the tribe of Benjamin. At first, they say uh, to the tribe of Benjamin, they say, just give us the men of Gibeah, and we'll deal with them, and we'll let the rest of you go. And the tribe of Benjamin says, they're our brothers. We'll stand with them. And so what ensues is three days of civil war that leads to the death of some 65,000 uh, Israelite men including, that's from both sides, including everyone in Benjamin. And when I say everyone, I mean everyone, except 600 soldiers who flee to the, the wilderness. The reason why, the reason why it was everyone, not just soldiers, was because uh, having driven all of the armed men, either killed them or the 600 men flee to the wilderness, then Israel basically commits what, it's like a scorched earth policy. And they, they burn every town in Benjamin, they kill every child, Every girl, every boy, every wife, they kill all the animals. It's just, it's just a scorched earth policy. And they say, may this never happen again. And there's 600 refugees that are living in the wilderness. But the days progress, their outrage subsides, and then they begin to regret nearly exterminating one of the 12 tribes. They think, well, you know, what happened in Gibeah was just awful, but it's also awful that the 12 tribes should, should not be represented. I mean, going back, you know, all the way to, to all the 12 sons of Jacob, there's been 12, there's, it's been 12, now we're incomplete. And though there's 600 men, there's no wives for them to have children with, which means this tribe is going to gradually die off. We find out that in their haste and their zeal, when they were, were 
burning the cities and killing the women and children, they had made a vow and said, we will never give one of our daughters to the Benjaminites for them to have children with. We will we'll never give our daughters to them as wives. So now they're stuck. They've, they, don't, they don't want a tribe to disappear off the face of the earth, but they can't give them wives. And so how will they resolve this in a time when everyone does what was just good in their own eyes? Can you imagine? Here's what they do. The tribes discover that one city, Jabesh Gilead, did not participate in the campaign. They say, are there any cities who did not send soldiers for us when we went to war against Benjamin? And they, just, they find out that nobody came from Jabesh Gilead. And they decide that by not standing with them, you don't just get to be neutral. You're not Switzerland. <laughs> you didn't stand in solidarity with, solidarity with us, and so you stood in solidarity with them. And so you get what they got. And so now they go into a second war. Again, this time against Jabesh Gilead, only this time they spare any unmarried women and girls. And they give these unmarried women and girls, there was 400 of them, to the refugees from Benjamin and say, these can be your wives. But they're still short 600. Okay? They've got now 200 single men. What are we going to do? Well, how would you, what would you do in a time when everyone does what's right in their own eyes? Here's, here's their solution. They tell the 200 single men that they can lie in wait for the girls of Shiloh to come out dancing during their annual feast. The feast of Shiloh happened annually, um, happened at Shiloh. Possibly some sort of fertility, right? And they say, during this thing, the women are going to come out dancing, the girls are going to come out dancing. When they come out dancing, you just hide in the vineyards. You wait for them to come out. You can grab one, throw them over your shoulder, take them home, she can be your wife. And that way, we haven't given you any of our daughters. You've kidnapped them. And when the, the, the men, the fathers, and the brothers of those women come and complain to us, we'll tell them to let it go. There you go. Which brings our author to his final conclusion, which is the last line of his book. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Total eclipse, total depravity. Israel has devolved to Sodom and Gomorrah. The author has been very selective. He's intentionally done this. And he's, he hasn't put it, in, again, in chronological sequence, but he's, he's doing it to make a point. So just two points. One is there's a problem in Israel, and it's pervasive throughout every tribe. Nobody got, got off the hook. Everybody, now, the problem in Israel manifests itself a little bit differently in every narrative. But every one of these stories have stories that are sinful, wicked, dark, bleak, just like all together, like who does that? And every tribe is involved. You can think about just the, the things throughout the book. He's been showing this picture of everything in decline. It all starts brand new day, but everything's in decline. Knowledge of God is in decline. Freedom is in decline. You know, Jeremy took us through, a, through the story of Samson last week. Uh, fantastic message. If you didn't catch it, you should go online and, and watch it. But one of the things that we didn't talk about is that whole sin cycle in Israel that they've been going on of the, the sin, slavery, crying out to God. There was something missing in Samson's story. The people never cried out to God because they had just become content with their slavery. Their slavery had become a comfort zone. And they're like, well, at least we know what to expect. And so Samson comes up as an antagonist. Basically, he just lives there to keep war happening between Israel and, and the Philistines. Freedom's in decline. True worship of God is in decline. Marriage is in decline. Hospitality is in decline. Sexual desire, lust, and appetites are unrestrained and in decline. Loving community or loving commitments in decline. Integrity is in decline. People make vows to God that they think that, that, that God will be pleased with that are just horrendous. Justice is in decline. Justice for this concubine. Justice for the 600 women and girls who were forced to marry these guys. Justice is in decline. Everything. And the reason the author tells the story, and he tells it in such a way that, that, that Israel has to come to terms with this, is that Israel, like us, has a propensity to see themselves as the good guys in every story. It's easier to identify with the good guys than it is the bad guys, isn't it? It really doesn't matter what the story is. It doesn't matter if it's literature or history or narrative or whatever it is. We tend to identify with the good guys in a story, the protagonists. And there's not a good guy in the story, at least not on a human level. There's no protagonist. 
And Israel has to come to terms with, there's something wrong with us. The stories are a wake-up call. They're like spiritual smelling salts where, where he puts a mirror in front of each person and says, look, look, there's a problem. It's abrupt, it's overwhelming, but it's very intentional. Because he's trying to bring a case, he's trying to make a case, and he hopes that they buy on his solution. So what's his solution? In those days, there was no king. Yeah, we had prophets, sometimes that worked, sometimes it didn't. We've had judges, sometimes that helped, sometimes it didn't. We haven't had a king yet. Maybe that's the solution. So that's his solution. I want you to take a moment at your table. So we're going to just engage at the tables for a minute. And I want you to think about our culture today. Step out of judges. Think about our culture today, the problems that we face. And, and just brainstorm all of the solutions to the problems of our culture today. Are, are they government solutions, education, military? Uh, whatever it is, think of, come up with as many solutions as you can think that are out in our culture for ways that people think we should address the problems of our culture. And then have somebody at your table go to menti.com and submit those. You, they have to be like one or two words long. Submit them. We're going to create a word cloud here. Um, so uh, on your mark, get set, go. All right, that's about enough of that. Look at you guys, you're like Sunday school teacher's pets. Like, Jesus, I don't know what the answer is, we've got to be Jesus. No, you're right. But here's the thing. Step outside of the answer that we know, we're in the church world, we know that Jesus and God are the answers to everything. You step outside of that, and you think about the, the solutions that are proposed, and even within this room, as we would evaluate the, the problems, the ills of society, we wouldn't agree on the solutions. Some of us would think we need more government. Some of us would think we need less. Some would think we need a different political party in office. Some would say we just need to help them. Some would say we need both political parties to be gone. We need a brand new one. Some would say we need... Um, better uh, border control. Some would say we just need better immigration policy. Some would say we need gun control. Some would say, no, we need to deal with the human heart because, you know, there's all kinds of answers to this. Some would say we need academics. Some would say we need science. We need, we need a cure for cancer. That's the biggest problem. We need a stronger economy. Some would say we need a stronger economy. Some would say we need more distribution of wealth, more equal distribution of wealth. There's all kinds of answers, and the reality is all those things are important. I don't want to downplay those things. Those things are important. They're markers of society. 
and what happens in government, education, science, religion. Some would say we need, we need to do away with the, the organized church and we just need to start all over with a whole different kind of church. We need to get rid of these current pastors and have new ones or not even have pastors, right? And some would say, no, we just need to get back to the way church was 50 years ago. And see, the, the spectrum's all over the place. And at the end of the day, all of those are important, but, but if we don't address the central issue, those are all just band-aids on a, a situation that requires heart surgery. Our author's solution, he looks around, he surveys everything, all the decline that's happening on every level, and he says, well, the answer is a king. And he's altogether wrong. Because as Israel's history is going to see, he builds his case well, and they get their first king, and when a king is good, it, it's, it's like a really big band-aid. It helps a lot. But as soon as that band-aid's gone, then they're right back where they started. And, and the next king might not be a good king. And then because he has more power, he's even worse than a bad judge or a bad prophet. And so a king is not the answer. We're going to see that in Israel's history. So the one, at one time, this this author who's writing the book of Judges, he's entirely wrong, and he's also entirely right. Because the answer to this is a king. It's what we're moving towards with the whole Easter story. It's a king, but it's a king that comes, and it's not, it's not a human king, it's not a military king, it's not a political king. He didn't come with academic solutions or military solutions or better legislation. He came as a servant king. He came as a suffering king. He came as a savior king. And so while the author doesn't realize, he's, he's, he's on the other side of the cross. He's looking forward and he goes, I think we need a king. And what he's saying is actually prophetic. What he would settle for was King David, who becomes the best human king that Israel ever knows. But what he's really talking about is a descendant of David that is the savior king. surprising thing with Jesus, Jesus is the long-awaited king that they're waiting for, descendant of David. The surprising thing is that he doesn't come with any of those solutions. They're hoping for a king that brings a military solution. At the time, their problem is Rome. They hope that the king will come that will deal with Rome. Rome was a problem. Nero was a problem. All of those Caesars, emperors, they were all problems, but they were symptoms of the deeper problem. The problem is that going back to the Garden of Eden, mankind has a sinful heart. That, that God created everything good, and then our first parents chose to rebel against God and declare independence from our Creator, and that introduced sin and death into the hearts of people. And, and in the same way that Genesis 1 says that when, when man was created, God made man and woman in his image, when they begin to perpetuate and have kids, it says that their kids are born, I think this is Genesis 4, it says their kids were born in Adam's likeness, in his image, which means he passes the sinful hard heart on. And so the reason we see these stories that are unapologetically bleak is that the real problem is the human heart. And what we need is a king that can deal with that. And so Jesus comes... And he doesn't come as a warrior king, but he comes as a savior king who offers his life to deal with the guilt of our hearts, the stain of sin, the guilt of sin, the, the weight of sin, the penalty of sin. He deals with that by, by, by offering himself as a perfect sacrifice in our, in our place. God's justice demands that punishment must happen for sin. There, the, it would be unjust to just ignore huge wrongs. But in God's justice, he absorbs that wrath himself. He absorbs the penalty himself. And then at his resurrection, he offers new life, new hearts. I've been reading Galatians this week and listening to it. I've been putting it on, on audio and just listening to it in my earbuds. And um, Galatians is a really rich book. It's in the New Testament. I would encourage you to listen to it. Maybe listen to it in a, a, a translation you're not used to. Maybe I've been listening to it in the NLT. I highlighted a few verses out of it. Galatians is a group of people, the, the Galatian church, their solution, here, they said the problem with mankind is we're on God's wrong side. We don't have good standing with, with God. Their solution was moral laws. And if we can all just obey the moral laws, then we'll do fine. Now, how many of you know that even if it looks to others like you're obeying the moral law, you know what's going on in your heart? In our hearts, we know of our sinfulness. We know of our selfishness. 
We know of the things that nobody else knows. And so the, ultimately that's not the solution, but Paul makes a case. He says, I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless, for if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. Jesus could have come into the world and said, hey, you guys just need better rules. If I clarify the rules, you'll be able to keep them and then it'll all be good. Religion's not the answer. Not religion without hearts that are made new. Because the unredeemed human heart is incapable of truly pleasing God. And so Jesus comes and he offers himself. So, so Paul says Jesus had to die in our place. Before the way of Christ was, in, was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. He's going to talk about how some of these things function in our society. Government, laws, religion. Before the way of faith was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. Look, the best government the best thing it can do in this season in between Jesus' first and second coming while, while we're still living in a fallen world, the best thing it can do is restrain sin, kind of protect us. It can leverage our selfishness to get us to do good things. You don't want to speed, you'll get a ticket. Like, all right. See, that's just, all the law can do is just kind of keep us in protective custody, but it can't deal with the real thing. What God offers to us is new hearts. Hearts forgiven, hearts made new, hearts filled with his spirit. And the text of Galatians says that when you put your faith in Christ, he puts a spirit in your heart. He gives you a new heart. That's what we celebrate today. In the midst of this darkness, we're going to close today with, with a song of worship. So I actually, would you stand with me? Because our author was right. What we need is a king. And we get to worship the king who gave himself for us. As we do this, I just want to pause and say this. The book of Judges is like a mirror held up in front of each one of us. And each one of us can find ourselves somewhere in the book of Judges. Selfish hearts, sinful hearts. We've, we've done wrong, we've wronged one another, and we also live impacted by the wrongs of other people. But there's a king who has come, and the first time he came, he came as a suffering king to pay the price for us. He's coming back, and when he comes back, he's not coming as a servant king. He's coming as Lord of all the universe. And we'll get to worship him, and it's going to be magnificent. It's going to be magnificent for those who've put their faith in him, who've allowed him to pay the price that, that we owe. And so if you're here this morning and you haven't put your faith in King Jesus, know that you can try the other solutions. You can try all kinds of solutions. You might even do some good but ultimately, you're not dealing with the real heart condition. And it's only Jesus that can do that. And, and, to, and to have, and to respond to him, it's as simple as saying, Jesus, yes. I put my trust in you. I renounce confidence in all the other things that could save me or change me or make me new. Anything that could make me acceptable to you. I, I, I renounce confidence in all of that. And I accept your gift that you paid my price. And will you make me new? And I'll follow you as king. Because he is a savior, but he's also king. So that means he gets to decide what we do with our lives. And we learn from him how to live our lives. So I just want to ask you this morning, if you're here and you don't know that you've put your faith in Jesus, maybe you've settled for something else that's a band-aid, maybe even religion. If you haven't put your faith in Jesus and say, you're the only one who can rescue me, if you haven't been brought to that place of despair when you see how bleak it is, here's the spiritual smelling salt. It's just Jesus. If that's you, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand before we worship. I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand right where you are. And we want to pray for you right where you are and just agree with you as you put your faith in Jesus and say, Jesus, I give you myself. If you'll, if you'll take my penalty, if you'll take my guilt, I'll give it to you. And in exchange, I give you my life. And you can be king. If that's you, just put your hand up wherever you are. And if you're near someone who's got their hand up, would you just put your hand on their shoulder? If you, especially if you're a Christian, if you've been through this, would you put your hand on their shoulder and just pray with them? 
And in the meantime, we're going to sing a song of worship and, and take our eyes off of the darkness because once you've seen how dark the darkness is, it makes us really appreciate the light. So let's worship Jesus, King Jesus. Jesus, you are our Savior King. And as we sing those songs, may they be more than words that we sing. May they, be, may they represent the posture and the actions of our lives. That we would no longer be a people who do what is right in our own eyes, but that we look to you to lead us in how to be your people. That you have redeemed us, you came pursuing us. And we would live our lives under your good rule and reign, that we would come back to that place of trusting that our creator is altogether good, and that everything you've made us for and your, your boundaries are for our protection and for our goodness. Would you help us to grow as a people who are um, being made into your image, form Christ in us, that we might be for your glory. As we live in between your, your servant king and your your resurrection king, your Lord of all the universe, your second coming. Would you send us out as people who have answers to, real answers to, to the deepest questions. That we would not settle for dealing with symptoms, but that we would go after the core. And Lord, as people who've had hearts change, would you send us into those places of influence? Send us into politics and education and, and business and, and science and, and religion. Send us into all these places as those who've been changed and are being changed. Would you finish the good work you've begun in us? In the name of Jesus, amen. Two things as we go out from here. They didn't think you could leave a message on judges with hope, did you? Uh, two things. Uh, we have some prayer 
uh, some, some uh, words for prayer. These are things our prayer team sensed God wanted to minister to this morning. So we're going to put those up on the screens. And uh, if you see yourself there, especially I'd encourage you to, uh, to get prayer this morning. So our prayer team is going to be underneath the, vi- the screens right here. And then additionally, we have a prayer environment on Monday nights out in the office lobby uh, that you can come to. It's called Soaking Prayer. So I do know we need more people to sign up for um, our Red Cross blood drive, which is happening uh, next week, not this week, but next week. You can sign up in front of the bookseller. And if you want to go feed people in the park today, if you want to go to Feeding God's Children, go out to the warehouse and you can meet out there. And, um, and we're going to go down and take some food to hungry people. Okay? Go make the invisible God visible.